Gracious God, our Father, we're grateful to you for your goodness to us. We thank you for each and every person here in this place today. This your house, the house of prayer. God, now we pray that you would speak to our hearts, challenge us, that we might be and do that that you've called us to do. We give you praise and glory for Jesus, who is our great example. And we give you all praise, glory, and honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Turn your Bibles to the book of the Gospel of John, John 13, chapter. Uh, I, I, wanna, I want uh, the liberty to walk up and down through this 13th chapter. Uh, 34 and 35 uh, is where we want to launch, but we're going to need to back up to fill in the spaces uh, for this. St. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. When you have it, say amen. amen. Begin reading now. And now pick up verse 17. Read now. <laughs> amen. Amen. Will the church say amen? amen? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We were all right until he said, you're happy if you don't, you know him, and you're happy if you do him. We got a little quiet there. I want to talk about, uh, can you love like Christ? Can you love like Christ? A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And he goes on to tell them to love ye one another. And he goes on in the 35th verse to let folk know that the only way men will know that you are my disciples is if you have love one to another. But what I want us to see in this 13th chapter of St. John is how Jesus loved, how he loved. He didn't love in word and tongue only, but he loved in truth in deed and in truth and that's how God wants us through Christ Jesus to love don't let your love simply be words spoken from your lips but not demonstrated in your life it was in 1965 when Hal David and uh, Bert Bacharach wrote the song, uh, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, uh, not just for some, but for every one. Now, I need you to know, though this is a secular song, there's much spiritual truth to that song. And psychiatrists have said man's greatest need is to be loved and to give and receive love.
man's greatest need is to be loved and to give and receive love. How true that is, my brothers and sisters. One of the things that I want us to understand here, if we look at verse 1 of St. John chapter 13, the narrative account tells us that they're getting ready for the Passover feast, and it's the eve before, and Jesus is making plain and clear some truths that he wants the disciples to hold on to. Now, many of us know this chapter or this account uh, as uh, the story or narrative of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Uh, most of us know that this did not happen uh, so that we could add a third ordinance to the church. First ordinance was baptism, second ordinance uh, was the Lord's Supper, but the third ordinance was not foot washing. Not that anything is wrong with foot washing, but that was a deeper message that the Lord was trying to get over to the disciples, that he's trying to get over to us, and we want to give as much attention to that deeper message beyond foot washing. It's about humility. It's about regardless of your position and your power that you should learn how to humble yourself and serve even the lowest among us. One of the things that I want to do is just kind of walk you through that. You can read it as you are listening or certainly in your devotional time. But in the Eastern time, in Jesus' time, they wore sandals, open face sandals. They didn't have closed in shoes. They didn't wear socks. They were open faced sandals. And when you went to folks' house, especially well to do folk house, uh, when you walked in either to the left or to the right, there was a bench, a basin, and a pitcher of water. And you would walk in and sit down on the bench and you would slip off your sandal and the servant or the slave would take your foot and he would pour the water in the basin and move the basin underneath your feet and stick one in and then the other and he would wash the dust off of your feet because in that day the roads were not paved with cement and asphalt they were dusty grimy dirty roads and so everywhere they went dust was kicked up and even after they had taken a bath going to other per places with other people their feet always got dirty so the custom was that if they were going to dinner especially a servant would be there to wash their feet well in this narrative there was no servant there to wash the feet of Jesus and the disciples and Jesus himself humbles himself he who came from God he who was going back to God, left an example for his disciples to follow so that they would understand how important it is to humble yourself and serve your fellow man. There are three things I want you to see about the verse 17. It says, if ye then know these things, Happy are ye. But it doesn't stop there. It says what? If ye do them. If ye do them. Jesus, listen, used his head, his heart, and his hands to serve mankind. Let me say that again. He used his head, his heart, and his hands to serve mankind. That's the example he has left for us, to use our head, use our heart, and use our hands 
to serve him. The head represented the information. Jesus knew the custom. There was no one there to wash their feet. They were going to have supper. So he knew the custom was that you would wash your feet. Not one of his disciples took the initiative to use their head and said, if I won't wash nobody else's feet, at least I wash my own. And yet Jesus took it upon himself and he implemented washing the feet of others so that they would have an example to do after him. The head was for information, the heart was for inspiration, but the hands were for implementation. See, what we've got to learn is that in ministry, we've got to use all of us to glorify all of him by serving mankind. And listen at this, my brothers and sisters. Jesus has made clear that if you want to be great in the kingdom, you've got to humble yourself and serve. Serve. So the first portion of this actually deals with the people's condition people or the person's condition because it's important to recognize if they don't use their head, don't use their heart, don't use their hands, they can't really serve. But what's important to know is what you have to do to serve. And there are three things, at least, there are multiple things, but three things I want to focus on that Jesus focused on in the text. The first thing was that Jesus used selfless love. Selfless love. Jot that down, selfless love. Here's why I need you to know that, because he's already made clear in the text that he's done this for an example. Now, if he's done it for an example, he wants us to pay attention to it, and he wants us to get the message of humility no matter how great you are. The servant is not greater than his Lord. And the man who is sent is not greater than the one who has sent him. And Jesus is trying to help them to understand as his father has sent him, so has he sent us. And if he can do it, we can do it also. Now listen, the first thing was selflessness. Now go back, if you will, read verses four and five. Verse four and five, right quickly, if you will. Begin reading now. Now listen, I want you to see something because this is an example of Jesus being selfless in his love. This, where he got up, took off his outer garment and laid it to the side was an example of what he did in glory. In heaven, he laid aside his divine dignity uh, deity as the son of God to come down he went from sovereignty to slavery he left heaven in all of its glory laid aside all that he was in glory to come down and be a servant to man I don't know who in this life has had a higher position than Jesus, and yet he could humble himself to give up, as the old folks say, heaven and all its immortal glory, and come down here and take on the form of a servant, humbling himself. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 tells us about this story. 
he, Jesus Christ, not counting it, you know, robbery to be equal with God. Why was he not counting it robbery to be equal with God? Because there are three things you need to know about Christ. Christ, listen, uh, he's coexistent with God. He's co-eternal with God. And he is co um, He's coexistent, co-eternal, and uh, another co will come back in a minute. Three things he is in his own right. God is in three persons, but it was only in the reality of his son that he came to planet Earth. And as co-eternal, as co-existent with God, he had no problem with being equal with God because he was what? Co-equal with him. He was co-equal with him. He was co-eternal and co-existent with God. If he was all of that, then if anybody had a right to be puffed up, it was Jesus. But he gave us the highest example of humility in humbling ourselves. My brothers and sisters, let me say this to you because a whole lot of us don't understand how humbling ourselves gives God the opportunity to raise us, to lift us. You see, when we lift ourselves up, whatever glory that's gained, whatever good that's gained, whatever prominence that's gain you want to claim. But when you humble yourself and God lifts you up, then God gets the glory as he gives to you the good. God has no problem sharing his goods with you, but the glory belongs to him. And we've got to learn when men try to give us glory for something God has done through us, we've got to learn how to receive that glory and usher it up to God and say, to God be the glory. I know they don't see God, say, see me, but I am a representative of God. So I've got to make sure that I usher the glory that is do God back up to him. So I want you to understand something here. He was selfless in his love. He laid aside his garment. How many of us would be willing to be second place and let somebody else get in front of us? How many of us would be willing uh, to say to someone else, listen, uh, let me step back and let you take the limelight. After all, it's all about him. No, we want to be the one shining the light. So we can get some credit for the process. Listen, selfless love came from Jesus. I want to show you something else too. He had steadfast love. Steadfast love. You know what? It doesn't matter if your love is selfless and is not steadfast. Don't you know some people who have loved you one moment and something has happened and they don't love you no more? Have you ever had an experience where you have continued to love them, but they have turned their backs on you? People do that all the time and call themselves Christians. I need you to see this. Go to verse 1. Verse 1. What you read at verse 1, when you get that, say amen. I want you to see this now. That's why I'm asking you to read and participate. Verse 1, I'm almost through now. Verse 1, read. Mm. 
How did he love them? How did he love them? Listen, he didn't have a lovely bunch of brothers there. But he loved them unto the end. Listen, divine agape love is God's love, God-like love. That's the kind of love that God gives to you that you give to others. Listen, it is the premier, supreme, superior love. God's agape love. It is this love that Jesus is talking about. It is this love that caused Jesus to come from glory and he was going back to glory after he had accomplished the things that he came down here to do. It was that love from the Father, of the Father, that he demonstrated to us and we are to demonstrate to others. My brothers and sisters, I need you to know it's important for you to recognize if you don't have God's love, you cannot love. Let, let me tell you why you can't love. Because if you don't have God's love, you can't love yourself. And if you can't love yourself, God news for you. You can't love nobody else. See, when you see people doing all of the harmful things to themselves, they, they don't love themselves. They have not come to that place where they love themselves. There are five words that Christians in every church should be well acquainted with so that they can flourish in the things of God. Five things. If you forget anything else I say here today, focus in on these five words. The first word is grace. Grace. Second word is faith. Faith. Third word is peace. Peace. Fourth word is love. Love. And the fifth word is Fellowship. Fellowship. See, in the Christian church, all of this can be found in these verses we're reading to you today. Jesus is emphasizing the reality of all of these things in the text to us. Listen, grace. Do you know what grace is? I'm not talking about the classic definition of grace. Um, uh, God's unmerited favor and his God's unmerited love, etc., and all of this. Uh, do, but do you really know what grace is? Well, get your pen and paper. I want you to know this so you have it. Grace is God's acceptance of me. You. You. Grace is God's acceptance of you. When you think about how powerful that is, God's acceptance of you by grace are you saved. God accepts you and you not being the best, but you being your worst. He accepts you. Listen, we can dress up on Sunday mornings and we can put on our religious talk and all our religious garbs and all that good stuff, but we know heaven ain't all in us. Truth of the matter is there's a little hell in us also. If you don't believe it, has anyone sinned last week? That's not heaven. <laughs> Listen, we, we got a little hell in us on, on the inside just like we have heaven on the inside of us. You, you've got to recognize, brothers and sisters, that in spite of who we are, what we've done, God's grace 
is his acceptance of me. Faith, faith, because if you're going to have the reality of his grace, his acceptance of you, then you have to join it with faith. By grace are you saved through faith, faith. Now, what is faith? Faith is my acceptance of God's acceptance of me. My acceptance of God's acceptance of me. That's faith. I attach my belief to what God has done. Listen, we are in partnership together in redemption. I said we're in partnership. He can't save us without us participating in the salvation. And so faith is my acceptance of God's acceptance of me. And then we have thirdly peace. Why do we have peace? Because the peace comes in that now that God has accepted me and now that I accept that God has accepted me, now I can accept me. Listen, so many people cannot and have not accepted themselves. And that's why they put on and they perform and pretend. They try to change themselves because they have not accepted themselves. They got to look like somebody else, look like the status quo, uh, on and on and on and on because there is no peace underneath the skin about who they are. You come to the reality that you might not be like this person or that person, but I got news for you. That person or the other person is not like you. And when you realize that you have been made according to God's design for your life, you can say, I am what I am by the grace of God. And it don't matter if you don't like me. It don't matter if I don't look like you. It don't matter if I don't fit in with you. I fit in with him. And I got peace like a river underneath my skin. I ain't trying to go broke trying to be like the Joneses. I'm, I'm not trying to wear myself out trying to become somebody else and do this, that, and the other. I am me because he made me me. And if nobody else accepts me down here, then there ought to be one person that I know of who accepts me. And that's me. The next word is love. Love, love, love. Now, love is important because I told you what the world needs now is love. We all need love. And that's what Jesus Christ came and gave to us through God the Father. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. That's grace. He gave. He gave. So here, love is important for us me to know and recognize in the church of Christ. If I have peace and I've accepted me, now I can love me. I can love me. Let me ask you a question. Does God love you? Is it all right for you to love you? Listen, it's important that you love you because if you don't love you, you cannot be the representative that God wants to pass his love to you to go through you to others. 
Remember, God sends a blessing. He sends his love. He sends everything that he wants in the earth realm to be passed on to you, the believer, so that as he sends it to you, he can send it through you. Through you. He's not going to give it to the world. The world is not his own. He gives it to his own, and he passes it through his own to others. You are an example of him. Him. So I can love me, and if I love me, guess what? I can love you. I love you. Do you love me? Say yes. <laughs> now we got the love issue straight. I love me, therefore, I don't have to lord over you. I don't have to have a big ego over you. I love you because I love you with the love he gave to me. I was not worthy of that love. You may not be worthy of my love. But it is my responsibility to love you. You. John says, I love him. Why? Because he first loved me. Me. See, you got to love him first, then love yourself, and then love others. As you love who? Yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And my brothers and sisters, when that love kicks in, that's when the reality of your service to God kicks in. And then you can have the last word fellowship who are you having fellowship with other blood bought believers who love the Lord and love each other the way God said that's why Jesus said that in that 35th verse that's the only way men will know that you're my disciples is if you have love one to another Love was not meant to be boxed and stored. But love was meant to be shared and demonstrated. The more you let the love of the Lord go through you and reach other folk, that's the reality of what real love is. And that's when you can serve like Jesus served. He wanted to show these disciples, listen, because I love you. I'm your leader. I'm your Lord. You've said so correctly. But if I can humble myself and wash your feet, then you ought to be able to wash one another's feet. My brothers and sisters, when we begin to recognize how powerful the grace is that God has given us, no matter who you are, what you've done, how far you've fallen, he has accepted you. And when you accept that he's accepted you, and you feel that peace on the inside of you, that I belong to him, I belong to God from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I belong to God. There's a peace that runs all through you that helps you to know that God's love, his grace causes us to want to fellowship with like God. How can we say we are brothers and sisters of the faith and have no fellowship with one another. We have been given a new commandment, Jesus said, that we love one another. That means it's a two-way street. 
It ain't like the old song, I found love. Mm. And lost it on a... Mm. Now, y'all don't know scripture, but you know that, don't you? It's a two-way situation. And you've got to have it in order to give it. A little boy, 12 years old, was riding with his father to the breeders to get a little puppy that he had been asking his father for for some years. And his father said to him, when you reach the point where you are able to take care of something that is alive, something that is living, when you can take responsibility of that living thing, then we'll get you a puppy. And that day had come and he was so excited. And they drove up to the breeders and they walked in and that was a bin full of little puppies. And the little boy looked at the little dogs and he saw one and he asked the breeder to reach it to him and he reached the little dog to him and he played with him. And he said, okay, he put him back. And he looked and said, oh, let me, let me see that one. And the breeder reached and gave him the dog, and he played with that one. But he noticed that at the back of the kettle was a little runty dog, small. He was just the worst of the litter. His right back leg was paralyzed and he couldn't use it. And yet when he saw the boy, there was a gleam and a glow in his eye and excitement. But when he saw the boy pick the other dogs like so many others had come and done, he learned not to get excited and he just stayed back in the corner. But the boy looked at the little dog again and he noticed something about that dog. He was special. He was different. He was unusual. And he said to the breeder, Breeder, may I, may I see that little dog way in the back? The breeder said, oh no, son, you don't want that dog. That dog there is problems. He's the smallest of the bunch. Uh, he has a paralyzed leg. He'll never be able to run. He'll never be able to catch and fetch. He'll, he'll never be able to do all the things. You get a puppy and raise him up into a full-bred dog. Uh -uh. In life, that's not the one you want. You want one of these others who are strong and healthy. And he looked at that little puppy again, and he said, no, I, I want him. And the breeder appealed to his father and said, sir, please help him understand that this dog has a bad leg. He cannot. He cannot run, jump. He cannot play with him. He cannot play catch. He cannot play fetch. He can't do all of the wonderful things that little boys like to do with dogs. The father looked at his son, and tears were rolling down the little boy's eyes. And he said, Dad, I want that dog. And the breeder said, Sir, can I ask you, little boy, one question? He said, sure. He said, son, please tell me, why would you want a dog that has a paralyzed leg, can't run, can't jump, can't play with you like all of these other dogs? Why would you want something like that? And the little boy pulled his right leg pant up. And there was a brace from the 
bottom of his foot all the way past his knee. And when the man saw the boy's brace, he said, I understand. What he understood was that boy knew what it meant to be accepted when nobody else wanted to. That boy knew what it was like to be picked over team after team, game after game, situation after situation. When you've gotten picked over so many times, you develop an attitude like you're not worthy. But my brothers and sisters, let no man fool you. If you are breathing God's air, you are worthy of the love of God. You are worthy of everything God provided for each and every one of us. Don't let the devil tell you you are not somebody. Matter of fact, I need you to encourage somebody on the side of you. Turn to the left and say, neighbor, you are somebody. Turn to the other neighbor on the right and say, neighbor, you are somebody. Now listen, you ain't got to see you. You know you point to yourself. Say, self, I am somebody. The Lord loves me. I love me. And I can love you too. Let's fellowship together. If we miss God in the example God is showing us about serving, about loving, about sharing, we miss the whole benefit of being blessed and being able to bless others. You've been blessed to be a blessing. I'll say that again. You've been blessed to be a blessing to others. God didn't give you your blessings to stack in store, but to show and share. And when we do this, we'll show forth the love of Jesus in this life. To God be the glory. The doors of the church are open, whoever you are. My brother, my sister. There's so many things the Lord desires that we would know, that we would show others. He gave to us that we might give to others. He loved us that we might love others. Everything the Lord gave to us in the earth realm he gave for his glory and for our good. We are his representatives in the earth realm. He needs us to know we have selfless love. We have steadfast love. And thirdly, we have serving love. He served out of love, out of love. No one asked him to do that. He thought about it. He felt it. And he did it. He used his head. He used his heart. He used his hands for service. What are you using for service? Can the Lord count on you to be a servant in the earth realm representing him? Are you using your head? Are you using your heart? Are you using your hands to serve the Lord through serving mankind? Jesus was getting ready to leave earth. He knew he was going to be crucified. He knew he was going to die on the cross. And yet he took out time 
to leave such a wonderful example and was thoughtful enough of us to remind us to do the same, to love others as we have been loved. It's a difficult task, no doubt. But when you have the love of God, that love is the only love that can cause you to love the unlovable, the unlovely, those who don't love you. That love is the only love that would cause you to be Christ's representative. The doors of the church are open. Is there one who will come today and say, Lord, use me in your service. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving me grace. I accept by faith, hallelujah, that you accept me with my faults, with my failures, with my frustrations. I, I, I accept the fact that you look beyond my faults and you still meet all my needs. Is there another? Glory to God. Glory to God. I need you to survive. Mm. With words, from my mouth I love you come on come on let somebody think about that as you're saying bring it up a little bit come on you pray oh Lord is there another the Lord is calling you now I need you I won't harm you with words from my mouth mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory. I need you to survive. Mm. Bless Jesus. Bless him, bless him, bless him. I need you to pray for me as I pray for you. I love you. I need you to love me. Mm. I can't say nothing good. I won't say nothing bad. I need you to survive. Is there another? This is our last appeal. If the Lord Jesus is speaking to you now, come on, get out that seat and come on down these aisles. He loved you so much that he came all the way from glory. Made a way for you and then went back up to heaven. That's love. That's love. Thank you, Jesus. Well, give the Lord a hand of praise.